Hi, I'm Liz Webb and I work for Coral Expeditions. I've had the pleasure of working here for over six years and also enjoyed many of our remote unique destination expedition cruising. Just in case you're new to Coral Expeditions, we are a small company with um, three small ships with a maximum capacity of 120 guests. So nice, um, small, intimate experience on board. We are Australian flagged and we travel to remote nature-based destinations um, around Australia waters and now going further into international waters. But we are, we're very pleased to say that we are going into our fourth decade of exploring the amazing Kimberley region. These webinars are to showcase the uniqueness of the, um, the Kimberley region. This particular one is focusing around the history of the region. Australia's Kimberley is the frontier land where dreamtime myths and legends abound, a land uninhibited by Indigenous Australians for approximately 60,000 years. The European influence on the landscape is much of a much more recent time. Today, we have the knowledgeable Steve Cox, previously part of our expedition team, but he's now moved into a role in the product team, making sure that all of our itineraries and experiences that you'll get to enjoy are covered and are able to be fulfilled. I'd now like to introduce Steve Cox. Um, he was part of our expedition team, but now part of our product team. So over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, I've been with the company for 12 years, maybe a bit more. Um, and 10 of those were, were out on our ships, uh, mostly on uh, Coral Discoverer, and even back in the days before that with the old girl CP1, uh, which is now heading off to, to other shores. Um, and the company has developed hugely in my time here um, from its very early starts to where it is now with two much larger ships. Um, but I think still fall into that small category with only 120 people, but it certainly has been, it's been amazing to see how the company has developed in a short time, really only the last sort of five or six years that it's, it's really stepped up. And, um, you know, there's not many Australian uh, run uh, companies left. And, you know, we're, we're all certainly very proud to be part of that. And, and today we're focusing on the Kimberley region where the company first sort of set foot in there well, a long time ago, decades ago now. And uh, I, I still remember many of the early stories from there of how a lot of places were, were found, um, a lot of them by accident <laughs> back in the day. Um, and um, we've been able to, to keep a lot of those places going and, and add in a lot of new places as well. There's a lot of history there and I think, as you alluded to earlier, it's a double-edged sword because there's there's this incredibly long Indigenous uh, history there with not just one group, but but four groups uh, in that region. And also the very late contact, and, and I say late because in the context of, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 years, people turning up in the 17 and 1800s is... <laughs> is late in the piece. It's very late in the piece. So, but it's all part of the jigsaw there um, that makes it, um, I think, still one of the, uh, the, the greatest destinations to visit, um, not just in Australia, but in the world. There's not many uh, places where um, the environment is still as pristine as it is. And, um, you know, we're, I think all of the companies that visit there uh, do everything they can to look after the place and take care of the place and respect the place. And we certainly uh, have that ethos um, when we visit any place through there. So it has a really fantastic history and we can't obviously cover it all because you'd be here for a long, long time. But, um, you know, just just quickly on a, on, a, on a European front, if you like, it has quite an interesting World War II history. Uh, there's many places along the coast that uh, where the war uh, that Australia was involved in, uh, and in particular, uh, Japan feature in that just because of the locations. Uh, one of the places that we are able to, to go and visit 
uh, in Vansittart Bay, out on a place uh, called the Anjo Peninsula. We're able to visit and look at this uh, incredibly kept C-53 Sky Trooper. Now, this is, went down in um, February 1942, uh, and it was an American Army Air Force plane that had been drafted in to help uh, move civilians uh, from uh, Broome up to Darwin because Broome had been suffering bombings from the Japanese. Uh, and it had been called in to help move people. And uh, they were doing a return flight back to Darwin. And uh, it's believed that they ran out of fuel. Uh, and the pilots, who I might add, were not long out of school. They were very young pilots. And two Australian uh, people, uh, uh, Army personnel in the back, uh, the pilots were able to bring the plane down and do a belly, um, wheels up belly landing. Uh, and there she sits today, uh, stripped of all its color back in when you, it went down, it, it would have had, of course, camouflage coloring. And, um, but it's in quite incredible condition. Um, the big square you can see cut out of it in the fuselage there was taken out just after World War II finished and a broom company got permission from the Australian uh, uh, Army, uh, I guess, or Air Force um, to remove all the parts from inside because civil aviation needed those parts for DC-3s. So <laughs> it wasn't, it was, that's when that particular cutout was done to take all the parts out of the inside. It's still in great nick and it's a, a really neat story in that those pilots went, when they brought that down, they were actually stuck there for a few days. Uh, and Japanese were flying over the top. And in fact, the Japanese knew exactly where they were. Um, but they, they didn't do anything. They didn't strafe them. They left them alone. Uh, and then in a very brave act, uh, a, a Qantas flying boat called the Corinthian, um, the pilot actually landed the uh, flying boat in the bay with passengers on board uh, during the daylight, which was highly dangerous stuff with the Japanese controlling the skies. And they actually, he sent uh, two of the crew ashore in a little rubber dinghy. And they went about, took them several hours to get the crew back on from uh, the wreck back onto the Corinthian. And he then started up the engines They had lumbered across the bay and up she went and and uh, when they were actually airborne, it nearly all turned uh, terrible for them because uh, they actually saw a Japanese uh, patrol flight up in the air and the Japanese did not sight the Corinthian, otherwise it, it would have got shot down. Um, so they, they were able to rescue the people ashore, but sadly, the, that same crew of the Corinthian that did that incredibly brave act uh, were actually killed. Um, when they were on another, not so long after actually, they were coming in to land at Darwin on the water and hit a log and the Corinthian went under um, and, and only the captain survived out of that. But it's a, it's a hell of a story what happened there and that plane is, she still sits there um, and it's a very easy walk, maybe a 15 minute walk, 10 to 15 minutes to get over and have a look at this really neat piece of World War II. Next, we're going to have a, a quick chat about, and I, I could talk all day about this guy, right, if you want. But, but obviously, no, I'm not allowed to do that. But um, he had a huge influence in, in the charting or mapping, if you like, of this part of the coastline, uh, similar to what James Cook did on the East Coast. But uh, this guy was just as detailed, and uh, he had been asked. Uh, to head over to the northwest coast of Australia and his job was to chart that part of the coast and their main concern there, the reason they asked him to do it was because they were so worried about the French uh, invading. Little did they know that uh, they had no intention of being around that part of the coast that was rugged and, and tough and um, not a lot there but no one really knew that back then so 
his task, first of all, on board the Mermaid, which was a tiny ship, tiny, tiny little thing, um, was to head along with the with the western winds um, coming around Australia and and coming past Broome and heading up that way up into the Kimberley because he needed that wind behind him coming out of the wet season. And then they knew that by the time he'd finished in the dry season, the wind would be easterly and he'd had the wind behind him coming back. So they didn't have the, the ability like we do with we can go off and see things and come back to a beautiful, <laughs> comfortable ship. Um, you know, they, they just had to work the winds and they had, and they had no idea about tides when they arrived there. They didn't know that they're going to be striking 10, 11 metre tides, uh, currents doing seven or eight knots. They had no idea about these things. And by the time he arrived in the Kimberley, he'd, he'd gone from having four anchors down to one before he even arrived. Um, so, you know, he, you have to think about it that every day could have been the last thing that they did there. One mistake, no one was coming looking, no one knew where they were, they were finished. So, um, you know, it's incredibly, um, you know, I don't know about brave's not the right word, they were just doing their job, but, you know, they were tough. I think I had to describe them, but um, anyway, Philip Parker King, uh, he was responsible for getting along and over four seasons, so 1817 through to 1821, he, uh, first of all, on the Mermaid for three seasons, then the last season he upgraded to a much larger ship called the Bathurst, which he didn't really like, even though he had his own cabin in it, which he didn't on board the Mermaid, but he couldn't get in as close. And uh, he liked the Little Mermaid Despite all the things wrong with it, uh, it was a ship that he actually preferred because it, it was much smaller and could get in closer, a bit like our ships, if you like, you know, where our ships are smaller and uh, they're designed to get in close to, to these types of coastlines. So, um, and, and what's good um, about when you come with us is we're able to pick up the trail of Philip Parker King. Um, doesn't matter whether you're going Broome to Darwin or Darwin to Broome. Both ways, we can pick up that trail and parts of it from, you know, if you're coming via Darwin, we can pick up that trail that he followed from Bansatart Bay, uh, where he went in there, and he named that after Lord Bansatart, who was the exchequer at the time, um, coming down the coast into Swift Bay and Big Island and uh, all places where he either visited or he named things or he had a story to tell about about the area uh, and then through to Careening Bay where he came ashore and then down into um, Prince Re uh, into Prince Regent River and then down the coast. So he did that over four seasons. One of the places that we will always head to is Careening Bay. Uh, and that's at the, the base as you head into to the Prince Regent River. And they spent 10 days here. Um, and the reason they did that was because on the east coast on board the Mermaid, they hit a reef or a rock of some kind and they badly damaged the stern post uh, on the Mermaid and they knew that they'd done it. They just couldn't do anything about it. But what he did do along the way was they discovered a cup, they knew where a couple of old wrecks were back from Cook's notes and they actually pillaged some stuff off those boats and uh, a bit of copper and other bits and pieces because they knew it might come in handy. And as he was going along that northwest coast, he was looking for a, a place where he could um, a tip, tip the ship over, careen it. So he needed a beach that con convexed and concave. Um, and had he knew that with the bigger tides coming in and out, if he got the right time at the, the end of the spring tides uh, coming onto the neeps, they'd have a seven to 10 day period where the tides wouldn't come in on them. And he, when they got into this particular bay, uh, he know, and they were anchored, he noted this beach over a couple of days, what it was doing and thought, well, this is it. This is the beach that's got everything we need to, to, to um, be able to come in at the end of the spring tides, take everything off, tip the ship over or careen it, and they were able to do their repairs. Uh, when, when they did, 
start their repairs and they had no idea what they were going to see underneath. So on the outside of these old ships, they used to pop a sheathing on and that helped protect so that when, if they hit reef or rock, uh, the, the copper was very bendy and mouldy and would take a, most of the hit and, you know, and that's exactly what it did. But when they took it off, they saw the stern post, of course, was badly broken. But also uh, the hull was just covered in holes. Um, and the reason was that where the ship was built in India, uh, they'd used iron nails and the iron nails had corroded. So <laughs> um, when they took it off, they realized there weren't any many nails left on there. So um, he was able to fashion out what copper he had, some copper nails to make some modest repairs. They fixed the stern post, put the copper sheathing back on. And when the spring tides came back in, they took the ship back up and, and got everything set um, and had to get themselves underway again. But it was leaking just as badly. <laughs> um, you know, they knew what they were in for. And, and from there through to, right through to Sydney, they had to pump. Anytime they were moving, two people were on that hand pump. So imagine how incredibly tiring and difficult that was to do right. Otherwise, they would they were gone. Um, but on the way, of course, he being the explorer he was, he didn't head straight for Sydney. He stopped and detoured and went into the Prince Regent River and all those, you know, and which was a huge delay. But uh, and then they made their way around the coast into Sydney and nearly died on the on the the night coming into Sydney because there was huge storms and they lost control of the ship. And he, he recorded in his diary looking up and a flash of lightning and it was daylight and they were inches away from the cliffs completely out of control but luck was with them the sea gods were with them and they got spat through and the next morning they were enjoying a pint of beer <laughs> uh so also um just backtracking a little just from there and having a look at a place called jar island it's a place we always do visit, and you've got the C-53 plane there uh, to look at. But it's also, it's, it's a place that has got many art sites. There's four, five different art sites there. Um, and the one that we've, we're going to focus on today and that we mostly visit is um, the upper and lower art sites at Jar Island. And Jar Island, that, that particular name came from... Philip Parker King, when he came into, into, into the bay, named the bay Bansatat Bay after the Exchequer, Exchequer, when they went ashore, he just, they saw a lot of pottery shards, which you can't see now because they've all been taken. Um, but um, when he went ashore, he saw them and he knew what they were. He knew that they were from the Macassans because there'd been previous contact um, so he'd quickly put two and two together and, you know, he knew where they had come from. Um, and it was always a concern for guys around then that they would run into these huge fleets of, of Macassans. And, and, but there was no, not that I know that there was any, uh, you know, too much trouble when they did meet. But anyway, uh, at Jar Island, we go ashore there. Um, it's incredible indigenous history there um, from the, the Wanambul people. Uh, and you're able to see uh, on Jar Island um, some really old depictions of um, indigenous art, both in a, uh, two lower galleries, which are, are easy to get to, and then one which is higher up. Uh, and, and certainly it's much more of a scramble and not for everybody to get up and have a look at. And that top one has got these really interesting animal uh, depictions. So that's showing when you go past that 10,000 years or sea levels rose up, uh, Jar Island would have just been uh, a rocky mound um, with grasslands all around. So people were walking to it, not, not on their boats. You have to, you know, and I always say to people when, when we're there that you have to you have to change your thinking a little about what you because all of this art that you're looking at, there wasn't water around then. <laughs> right? Only the fish, right? Um, but a lot of these uh, date back to especially the older Guion 
um, art or what they used to call Bradshaw art, um, you know, ha has got taglines from 20,000, 40,000, even 50,000 years around that area. And the good thing is a, a lot of that art has been carefully studied there. So there's a lot of research um, which you can look at online before you, which I advise people do before you, you, you join your cruise so that you can, um, you know, have a good understanding about what you're looking at. There's, there's no shortage of information online. And also, you know, you'll have all of our guest lecturers plus our expedition team to, to help you along there. So it's a really interesting day for Indigenous art. And, and then on that, the other side of that same day, you've got the piece of World War II history. Yeah, so there's Swift Bay, which is a little further down the coast. And this is a fascinating place because uh, not only is there really good indigenous art here, but what I think is more interesting, uh, well, I find it more interesting anyway, is that this was clearly a living site. Um, and it, both art sites that we visit, um, there's strong signs that you can see that, that um, groups were either permanently based or more than semi-permanently based there. And I suspect at the, at the back art site there that you'll visit that they were probably there permanently. They probably, only time they were moving was for water. Um, and there's all sorts of different art here. And this is one from what we call the Gorge art site that you can see here. Uh, and what's unique about it, and this is a bit of a scramble up to get to this particular site, but the payoff is that it's very rare to, nowadays to still see this yellow ochre as infill. Uh, and these are guion. Um, uh, you do not see this often, and, and I've probably only seen it in one or two other places um, where you can see the detail. There's both where there's the, the ordinary red, but also on that right-hand side, you can see, and there's quite a few that are done this style at this particular art site where the infill is yellow ochre. Um, so that, I think that's very interesting because it's quite unusual. And there's all here, there's obviously generational art because at the same site, there's uh, these drawings of fairly recent fish, right? So this is times from very, very old stuff to much more modern where they're depicting what they're catching and eating and um, there's stories of hunting up there. Um, so it's a really fascinating art site, uh, that particular one. And then further back um, at that same site, but a, a different art site, um, there, uh, it's a really amazing place to visit there because there's a huge wanjana, two huge wanjanas that are as tall as a human. Um, and they both have very different stories. Um, and also a long, it's a big, long, stretched out uh, art site. And it depicts, there's guion art there, there's um, contact art, there's um, art that is, um, showing hunting techniques. There's even a naughty piece of art there. <laughs> um, so it, it's a very, very fascinating place to look. And then the furthest away site at Swift Bay, which um, again, you, you'll get to see, is um, got incredible Wanjana art but it's also a living site. And you can see where people have been sitting on the rocks for a millennia. And you can see ground out places where they were making their ochre. And um, so it, uh, uh, Swift Bay is, is a really fascinating um, spot for me, always has been, yeah. Uh, Montgomery Reef, probably, you know, it, it's one along with Tel Bay, one of the big icons and I don't know how many times I've seen it. No, a lot, a lot. But every time that I've been there, uh, it just blows me away. And I, and I can think back to the very first time that I saw it. And I always think about that when guests, uh, um, uh, you know, they're on the Explorer on the way over, just thinking, what is this going to look like? Um, and I remember thinking, 
this is not what I was thinking about with a reef. So, you, you know, you, you have to take the Great Barrier Reef thoughts out of your mind. This is a, a large um, offshore reef system that it, it, it's built over um, a, a flat rock um, formation. Um, it's probably about seven, eight thousand years old in its current state. It's you know between three, four hundred uh, kilometers squared in size, uh, and it has one natural channel that uh, boats are able to access. You can't come ashore, you can't go ashore here. Um, you can only view via um, the, the explorers and also what we always have then, you can see in the picture, the zodiacs out there as well. And um, people can have the, and I encourage people when you're there to get off the explorer and get onto one of the zodiacs and the guys will be able to take you right up to those edges. Um, and you can see all that runoff and the runoff into that particular um, canal that you can see, um, the canal is, is just separating two reef systems. So before that water was there, you'd have been able to walk out there and walk down that channel and have uh, big flat top rock faces either side of you, which would have been pretty cool, right, to be able to do. But as sea levels rose up, it was kind of just a perfect storm um, where the, the, it was just out of the uh, poking up enough that when water levels rose and then came back again, um, it all became perfect, right? It was just settled so that when the, the tide drops down, so you can get nine, 10 meter tide. You technically in a small boat could run right over the top of that. And I'm sure in the old days that happened, it happened a lot. Um, but <coughs> excuse me, as the tide comes down from about 4.2, 4.3 meters, you'll just see this reef starting to appear uh, out of nowhere. You know, I, lots of times we're, we're at anchor before that tide drops away and people come and say, oh, I can't see it. I cannot see this thing. Where is it? I said, just give it 40 minutes, give it an hour, and then they'll, oh, it's there. Yeah. So the water drops away and, um, you know, from about 4.3. Uh, dropping down, and this can go to a zero one, um, where huge amounts of that reef is exposed. And, and we can go into that channel on any tide, um, whether it's a zero one or it's, you know, at, at that sort of um, three, four meters. Uh, it, it's home to a great turtle population, and they're not breeding there, but they are there eating, because there's lots of seagrass on the bottom around that area. Um, it's got these beautiful corals on the edges um, that it, it, until you're up close, you kind of think, well, it just looks like a moonscape. Um, but when you're up close, you'll see all these incredible small corals. It's everything in miniature. Nothing's big yet. Because this is out of the water twice a day and getting banged by 35, 36 degrees sun, uh, it has winds, it has wet season. Um, you can't be a namby pamby coral there, right? You've got to be, you've got to be tough and strong, and that's exactly what these corals are. So, and they've done a lot of studying of these corals in the last, particularly five or six years, with teams going out there, and they've discovered new species of coral and a couple new species of fish out there. Um, and they've also discovered that it's an incredibly healthy reef system, um, and they've only just started looking at things like. Is it, is it coral bleaching? What's happening with the water temperatures there? Um, they're, they're starting to get all that information about this area because what happens here, because it's so big, what happens at um, Yawa Jabai or, or Monte Reef affects everything along that coastline. Amazing stuff, Steve. This, uh, you're bringing it to life and making me think back of the, the voyage that I had in 2018, yeah. so I definitely need to get back on there. Maybe next time you can take my personal guide. I will. Surely <laughs> uh, I'll do that. Thank you. you. And I know that um, all the expedition team and our masters on board as well, they're always looking for new spots and something different to add to it. And out exploring, getting our passengers to travel with them and go, this is new. We've never seen this. We've never done that. I will say that I, everyone should take your advice, read up on the Kimberley and the history before going and joining the voyage. Yeah, 100%. Um, 
it's all there. So we've got information on our website, the Coral Connections. We've got a really resourceful library on board, but there's also some other parts that and you can go and find information and books. And we, in our pre-cruise documentation, we even um, provide um, what to read, some interesting Correct. books and everything Correct. to do. So, but thank you for um, talking to us about the, um, the history of the Kimberley. Um, the next week's um, webinar with Steve again will be based on nature in the Kimberley. And we're going to be also having a live webinar scheduled on the 26th of April with one of our other um, expedition leaders, Dawn. She's been with the team for a little while, but she'll be doing a live one. So we've got these recorded ones for you to keep going back and dreaming and waiting for you to um, travel one day with us or reminisce like I have been during this presentation. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.